Broadcasting from Lothlorien, Middle Earth, this is the Secret Fire Podcast, sent to burn at the heart of the world, episode number 41. I'm Michael. And I'm Micah. On this episode, book two, chapter seven of the Fellowship of the Ring, The Mirror of Galadriel. What can we learn from the Lord and Lady of the Golden Wood? Is there anything more that we can learn from Gandalf? We invite you to come along, join the fellowship, become a servant of the Secret Fire right here on the GCT Network. This is your Great Commission transmission. Happy Tolkien Reading Day, Micah. Woohoo. Every March 25th. It was started in 2003 by the Tolkien Society to encourage the reading of J.R.R. Tolkien. And and like you said on uh, take one of this episode, <laughs> it's a shame that they would have to encourage people to read uh, Tolkien on mm-hmm. a daily basis. Uh, they started, uh, well, they chose March 25th uh, because that was the date uh that the fall of Sauron took place. And so in in honor of uh, of that event... An appropriate day. Yes, absolutely. And so in order to mark this special occasion, we're going to read through part of... Well, the listeners know that. We do this every single time. We're going to read through a section of, of the book. But this time, let's go ahead and start with uh, the pro- uh, Tolkien professor... I mean, <laughs> The Tolkien Professor. Uh, yes, well, there you go, Corey. <laughs> you just got a shout-out. <laughs> professor Tolkien himself. I cannot read the fiery letters in Frodo in a quavering voice. No, said Gandalf, but I can. The letters are Elvish, an ancient mode, the language that of Mordor, which I will not utter here. This in the common tongue is what he said, close enough. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and the darkness bind them. There's only two lines of a verse long known in elven law. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky, seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone, nine for mortal men doomed to die, one for the dark lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Beautiful. Good job, Tolkien. Where are we in uh, Lord of the Rings Online? Exactly where we left off in the book. Kieran Amroth. Fantastic. Kieran Amroth is that hill. Now, we talked about Amroth when we were discussing Nimrodell, mm-hmm. right? The, the, the elven maid. Fantastic story. Uh, Kieran Amroth was a mound in the heart of the ancient land of Lothlorien on which grew two rings of trees and a great tree with a white flat. Remember, Amroth was that was the king who fell in love with an elven maid. Mm. Oh, and that that song, uh, just beautiful and tragic, right? Yes. We listened to a great version of that by Brocellion. So if you missed that episode, go back and listen to it. Uh, the hill was originally pi- or was piled up after the first millennium of the Third Age to be used as an outlook post for the growing shadow of Dol Guldur. Amroth, the king of Lorien, later built a house on the flat to use as a home, and the hill became named after him. However, his house was not present century uh, later. We, we don't see it there on the flat now in uh, Lord of the Rings Online, right? And the hill was covered with Eleanor and Nifredil. It was here that Aragorn and Arwen betrothed, betrothed centuries later, and where Arwen surrendered her life in the Fourth Age, 121, mm-hmm. which we will learn more about when we get to the appendices of the Lord of the Rings. So, Micah, as we are wont to do, won't, won't, Let's uh, go ahead and back up just a little bit and get a uh, running start. Well, here we are uh, at the hill of uh, Kieran Amroth. At the uh, hill's foot, Frodo found Aragorn standing still and silent as a tree. But in his hand was a small golden bloom of Eleanor, and a light was in his eyes. He was wrapped in some fair memory, and as Frodo looked at him, he knew that he beheld things as they once had been in this same place. For the grim years were removed from the face of Aragorn, and he seemed clothed in white, a young lord tall and fair, and he spoke words in the elvish tongue to one whom Frodo could not see. 
Arwen Vanemelda Namari, he said. And then he drew a breath, and returning out of his thought, he looked at Frodo and smiled. Here is the heart of Elven Dim on Earth, he said, and here my heart dwells ever, unless there be a light beyond the dark roads that we still must tread, you and I. Come with me. And taking Frodo's hand in his, he left the hill of Karen Amroth and came there never again as a living man. And that brings us to chapter seven, The Mirror of Galadriel. Awesome. You ready for an adventure? Sure am. Remember what Bilbo used to say? It's a dangerous business, Frodo. Going out your door, you step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. The sun was sinking behind the mountains and the shadows were deepening in the woods when they went on again. Their path now went into thickets where the dusk had already gathered. Night came beneath the trees as they walked and the elves uncovered their silver lamps. Suddenly they came out into the open again and found themselves under a pale evening sky pricked by a few early stars. There was a wide treeless space before them running in a great circle and bending away on, e on either hand. Beyond it was a deep fosse, lost in soft shadow. But the grass upon its brink was green, as if it glowed still in memory of the sun that had gone. Upon the further side there rose to a great height a green wall encircling a green hill thronged with malorn trees taller than any they had yet seen in all the land. Their height could not be guessed, but they stood up in the twilight like living towers. In their many-tiered branches and amid their ever-moving leaves, countless lights were gleaming green and gold and silver. Haldir turned to the company. Welcome to Karas Galathan, he said. Here is the city of the Galathrim, where dwell the Lord Celeborn and the and, Gal and Galadriel, the Lady of Lorien. But we cannot enter here, for the gates do not look northward. We must go round to the southern side, and the way is not short, for the city is great. Michael, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, how this is depicted in The Lord of the Rings Online. Okay. So, uh, Kirith Amroth is, is north of the city, Mm -hmm. And then we came down what on the um, on the eastern side. I came down on the uh, western side. Oh, did you? You can come down on on either side, obviously. Uh, oh, the fellowship, you mean? Yeah. Oh gosh, I'm not sure about that. I'm pretty. Uh, I think so. I, I think it would be the eastern side. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that uh, that foss or whatever that uh, is uh, going around the. Um, uh, well, it actually reminds me of uh, how they have. Um, uh, Bree set up. Yeah, a, a hedge. As yes. Described in the book as a hedge. So, yeah, it does look very similar to that. Yeah. And it's like, depicts like a natural beauty, but also a form of defense, you know? Well, Foss is a long, narrow trench or excavation, especially in a fortification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I got some fantastic pictures from, uh, from there. Uh, and it was, uh, I believe it was in uh, Dusk. Oh, goodness. I'll, I'll post those for the blog post on, on this episode. Absolutely gorgeous. So there you go. We do, we're, we're trying to... Pitch. Yeah, they, they did right by it. <clears throat> there was a road paved with white stone running on the outer brink of the foss. Along this, they went westward with the city ever climbing up like a green cloud on the, upon their left. Oh, so maybe they did go the same way that you did. Yeah, I think so, probably. Well, ah, well it doesn't yeah, matter. I mean, if the if the city was uh, climbing up like a green cloud on their left, mm -hmm. and as the night deepened, more lights sprang forth until all the hill seemed a fire with stars. They came at last to a white bridge and crossing found the great gates of the city. Uh, they faced southwest, set between the inns, 
of the encircling wall and here overlapped and they were tall and strong and hung with many lamps. Haldir knocked and spoke and the gates opened soundlessly. But of guards, Frodo could see no sign. The travelers passed within and the gates shut behind them. They were in a deep lane between the ends of the wall and passing quickly through it, they entered the city of the trees. No folk could they see, nor hear any feet upon the paths. But there were many voices about them and in the air above. Far away up on the hill, they could hear the sound of singing falling from on high like soft rain upon leaves. How about that for a description? Yeah, it's awesome. They went along many paths and climbed many stairs until they came to the high places and saw before them amid a wide lawn a fountain shimmering. It was lit by silver lamps that swung from the boughs of the trees, and it fell into a basin of silver from which a white stream spilled. Upon the south side of the lawn there stood the mightiest of all the trees. Its great smooth bowl gleamed like gray silk, and it uh, up it towered until its first branches far above opened their huge limbs under shadowy clouds of leaves. Beside it a broad white ladder stood, and at its foot three elves were seated. They sprang up as the travelers approached, and Frodo saw that they were tall and clad in gray mail, and from their shoulders hung long white cloaks. Here dwell Celeborn and Galadriel, said Haldir. It is their wish that you should ascend and speak with them. One of the elf wardens then blew a clear note on a small horn, and it was answered three times from far above. I will go first said Haldir. Let Frodo come next and with him Legolas. The others may follow as they wish. It is a long climb for those that are not accustomed to such stairs, but you may rest upon the way. As he climbed slowly up, Frodo passed many flats, some on one side, some on another, and some set about the bowl of the tree so that the latter passed through them. At a great height above the ground, he came to a wide talon, like the deck of a great ship. On it was built a house so large that almost it would have served for a hall of men upon the earth. He entered behind Haldir and found that he was in a chamber of oval shape, in the midst of which grew the trunk of the great Malorn, now tapering towards its crown and yet making still a pillar of wide girth. The chamber was filled with a soft light. Its walls were green and silver and its roof of gold. Many elves were seated there. On two chairs beneath the bowl of the tree and canopied by a living bough, there sat side by side Celeborn and Galadriel. They stood up to greet their guests after the manner of elves, even those who were accounted mighty kings. Very tall they were, and the lady no less tall than the lord, and they were grave and beautiful. They were clad wholly in white, and the hair of the lady was a deep gold, and the hair of the lord Celeborn was a silver, long and bright. But no sign of age was upon them, unless it were in the depths of their eyes. For these were keen as lances in the starlight, and yet profound, the wells of deep memory. Hmm. What, what kind of a image are we getting here? Where'd my music go? Oh, there you go. With um, the depiction of the elves? Well, this, uh, this scene here, uh, Frodo, uh, this is so foreign to him you know he knows he knows some elvish and he knows some elvish lore thanks to bilbo mm -hmm. but to be in the presence of these two beings uh the way that that tolkien describes them you know th no sign of age was upon them unless it were in the depths of their eyes yeah. for these were keen 
as lances in the starlight and yet profound. The wells of deep memory. The history that is, um, we're just meeting these people. What kind of impression are we getting? There, well, we've been talking about Lothlorien and especially this city really being uh, like a picture of Eden or of a garden or of a, of a, of a, of a temple, right? Uh, this is a place on Earth, in Middle Earth, where uh, Arrow Iluvatar's presence is least corrupted or tarnished, right? All around, well, obviously in Lothlorien, I mean, uh, in Rivendell, the, the, the pretty pure there as well, correct? Mm -hmm. But they are talking about being uh, on the on the on the knife's edge of. Oh well, wait, boy, there was a tease. I shouldn't have said that. They, uh, uh, <laughs> that uh, that that war could come to Rivendell at any time, right? But here is a place where the enemy, which is just across the river, and they can observe them. The enemy is not aware of them. It's just it, it. It's just amazing in this short passage. How much Tolkien packed into that. There's this history and this lore, and even if you, uh, this is your first time reading through the Lord of the Rings, you get to a, a section like this, and you are, or you should be, deeply impressed with his craft oh absolutely you should from the beginning <laughs> yeah so those are just some thoughts about that anything you want to add to take away no i think you got it do you think i misrepresented that did i oversell that no oh, I okay think can't oversell this <laughs> all right how dear led frodo before them and the lord welcomed him in his own tongue the Lady Galadriel said no word, but looked long upon his face. Sit now beside my chair, Frodo of the Shire, said Celeborn. When all have come, we will speak together. Each of the companions he greeted courteously by name as they entered. Welcome, Aragorn, son of Arathorn, he said. It is eight and thirty years of the world outside since you came to this land. Eight and thirty years, thirty-eight years. He's old. Yes, well, we'll find out exactly how old he is later on. It is eight and thirty years of the world outside since you came to this land, and those years lie heavy on you. But the end is near, for good or ill. Here, lay aside your burden for a while. Welcome, son of Thr Thranduil. Too seldom do my kindred journey hither from the north. Welcome, Gimli, son of Gloin. It is long indeed since we saw one of Durin's folk in Caris Galathrin. But today we have broken our long law. May it be a sign that though the world is now dark, better days are at hand and that friendship shall be renewed between our peoples Gimli bowed low our our Gimli mm -hmm. we talked so much about him and and the he's an honorable dwarf he believes in honor he and respect and respect and he treats people with honor and respect you know just like how people really should do you know? mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Gimli bowed low. When all the guests were seated before his chair, the Lord looked at them again. Here there are eight, he said. Nine were set out, so said the messages. But maybe there has been some change of counsel that we have not heard. Elrond is far away, and darkness gathers between us, and all this year the shadows have grown longer. 
Nay, there was no change of counsel, said the Lady Galadriel, speaking for the first time. Her voice was clear and musical, but deeper than a woman's wont. Gandalf the Grey set out with the company, but he did not pass the borders of this land. Now tell us where he is, for I much desire to speak with him again. But I cannot see him from afar, unless he comes within the fences of Lothlorien. A gray mist is about him, and the ways of his feet and of his mind are hidden from me. Alas, said Aragorn. Gandalf the Grey fell into shadow. He remained in Moria and did not escape. At those words, all the elves in the hall cried aloud in grief and amazement. These are evil tidings, said Celeborn, the most evil that have been spoken here in long years full of grievous deeds. He turned to Haldir. Why has nothing of this been told to me before? He asked in the elven tongue. We have not spoken to Haldir of our deeds or our purpose, said Legolas. At first we were weary, and danger was too close behind, and afterwards we almost forgot our grief for a time, as we walked in gladness on the fair paths of Lorien. Yet our grief is great, and our loss cannot be mended, said Frodo. Gandalf was our guide, and he led us through Moria. And when our escape seemed beyond hope, he saved us. And he fell. Stop. We're going to pause here for a moment, dear listeners, because you know one of the purposes of the Secret Fire podcast is to discover the Christian themes that Tolkien embedded into his fantastic legendarium. Of course, as we mentioned often uh, from letter number 213... J.R.R. Tolkien wrote, I was born in 1892 and lived for my early years in, quote, the Shire, unquote, in a pre-mechanical age. I am a Christian, which can be deduced from my stories and, in fact, a Roman Catholic. I am a Christian, which can be deduced by my stories. Of course, we know that Tolkien wrote uh, in the uh, the foreword to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, he wrote, I cordially dislike allegory and all of its manifestations and always have done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader, applicability, and the other in the purposed domination of the author, unquote. So, we know that this is not allegory. We mention it, I, I think, I hope that we do on almost every episode for any new listeners that come along. We know that this is not uh, um, Tolkien exerting dominance over the readers and saying you will get this out of the story and... Uh, and whatnot and and uh, so forth but he does say that it has applicability and applicable is an adjective right and it means relevant or appropriate so Tolkien by saying on one hand that uh, that uh, we can deduce that he's a Christian from his stories then on the other hand, he has given us the freedom to find the uh, to define the applicability in our case. And that's what I'm going to do right now. Our grief is great and our loss cannot be mended, said Frodo. Gandalf was our guide and he led us through Moria. And when our escape seemed beyond hope, he saved us and he fell. We have over and over and over again uh, talked about uh, Peter Kreef's, uh prophet, priest, and king motifs that he finds in The Lord of the Rings. Frodo, the priest. Aragorn, the king. 
Gandalf the prophet, but they are all a picture. They are all a signpost pointing to Jesus Christ. There is, uh, there's, there's a little bit of Jesus's fullness in each of these characters separately. He saved us and he fell. In the, the upper room, John is the only one that records what really takes place in the upper room. I mean, it's how many chapters is it? Two, three? And he gives us a, a, a picture of what was important to Jesus. Remember, Christ said, I earnestly desire to eat this meal with you. The last meal that he would ever eat. And he knew that. He knew it. He had set, we, we can go way back in, in uh, the Gospel of John and see that Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem, indicating that he was on this path and nothing was going to deter him from, uh, from his mission uh, and, and his death, burial, and resurrection. But, the, but you know, uh, this last supper, Jesus was talking to his disciples and talking to them one-on-one -on -one and giving them... Um, Oh, gosh, the, the, some of the most profound teachings of his ministry, you know, starting right off with washing the disciples' feet, you know, and Peter says, oh, you're not going to wash my feet, Lord, no way, you know, and he says, if I, if I don't get to wash you, then you have no part in me, and Peter says, okay, not my feet only, but, you know, all of me, and Jesus says, no, you're clean, I'm giving you a picture, this is, you know, see what the Son of Man does, see what the Son of God does, you go and do the same, because he continues on, and in uh, uh, chapter 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give you, Jesus said, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, by this you will know by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And he continues down and and in, in chapter 15, he he repeats himself, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And there actually is in here, uh, basically, fly, you fools. Okay, that's what Gandalf, you know, had to say. That was his last words. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And then he continues down, ver uh, verse 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. Back in chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Gandalf was our guide, Frodo says. What is a shepherd? A shepherd is a guide. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me, right? Continuing in John chapter 10, verses 14 through 15, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And when our escape seemed beyond hope, Frodo says, Gandalf saved us, and he fell Last verse, sticking with John, let's go to his first epistle, 1 John 3, 16. We know love by this. Picture, <laughs> Picture Frodo saying this. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren or the company or the fellowship. Yeah, even in death, Gandalf leaves us a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. End of sermon. Any questions? Anything? Very well done. Yes. Um, let me just back up a little bit again because this is so...
at these words. What words? And I think this is as far as we're going to get today, Micah. Gand alas, said Aragorn, Gandalf the Grey fell into shadow. He remained in Moria and did not escape. At these words, all the elves in the hall cried aloud in grief and amazement. These are evil tidings, said Celeborn, the most evil that have been spoken here in long years, full of grievous deeds. He turned to Haldir. Why has nothing of this been told to me before? He asked in the elven tongue. We have not spoken to Haldir of our deeds or our purpose, said Legolas. At first we were weary and danger was too close behind. And afterwards we almost forgot our grief for a time as we walked in the gladness on the fair paths of Lorien. Yet our grief is great and our loss cannot be mended, said Frodo. Gandalf was our guide. He was our shepherd. He was the good shepherd. And he led us through the valley of the shadow of death. And when our escape seemed beyond hope, he saved us. He laid down his life for the company. And he fell. Tell us now the full tale, said Celeborn. Then Aragorn recounted all that had happened upon the pass of Caradhras, and in the days that followed, and he spoke of Balin and his book, and the fight in the chamber of Mazarbul, and the fire, and the narrow bridge, and the coming of the terror. An evil of the ancient world, it seems, such as I have never seen before, said Aragorn. It was both a shadow and a flame, strong and terrible. It was a Balrog of Morgoth, said Legolas. Of all elf banes, the most deadly save the one who sits in the dark tower. Indeed. I saw upon the bridge that which haunts our darkest dreams. I saw Durin's bane, said Gimli in a low voice, and dread was in his eyes. Alas, said Celeborn, we have long feared that under Caradhras a terror slept, but... Had I known that the dwarves had stirred up this evil in Moria again, I would have forbidden you to pass the northern borders, you and all that went with you. And if it were possible, one would say that at the, at the last Gandalf fell from wisdom into folly, going needlessly into the net of Moria. He would be rash indeed that said that thing, said Galadriel gravely. Needless were none of the deeds of Gandalf in life. Those that followed him knew not his mind and cannot report his full purpose. But however it may be with the guide, the followers are blameless. Do not repent of your welcome to the dwarf. If our folk had been exiled long and far from Lothlorien, who of the Galathrim, even Celeborn the Wise, would pass nigh and would not wish to look upon their ancient home, though it had become an abode of dragons? Hmm. Mike, I think, uh, think we're going to need to stop there. You need say no more. We'd best get a move on. There are still goblins about. Oh, bother. More mountains? No. Don't you see? The sun is setting in the west, behind the mountains. We're on the other side, to the edge of the land beyond. It may seem to be an unfortunate place to stop, but this is some heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. I want it to be able to sink in. Yeah, this is a... <laughs> This is where we really see the Christ 
figure in Gandalf in this exchange. You know, I, I'm thinking of uh, the road to Emmaus. You know, the, the, the disciples, the apostles, they were with Jesus for three and a half years and they knew him, but he would say things that they just could not wrap their heads around. You know, and, and, and where um, Galadriel really makes this description that, that could be applied to Jesus in life. Needless were none of the deeds of Gandalf in life. Those that followed him knew not his mind and cannot report his full purpose. I don't think that they would be able to now, here a little bit, a little bit further on in the future, maybe things might change a little bit. But where where we stand now, the, uh, I, I picture the um, all of the disciples that were gathered together in fear after the death of Jesus. They were fearful, and things happened. Even though Jesus said, "I'm getting the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be delivered up into the hands of men, and there he's going to be, you know, he's going to be crucified, he's going to be buried, and he's going to rise again on the third day." They did not understand what that meant. What's he talking about? And here, are the company, well, especially Frodo, Legless, Aragorn, Gimli, they're sad and they're hurt and they're confused. Why did Gandalf, why did our guide have to leave us? So I wanted to plant those thoughts into the minds of listeners, the minds and hearts of listeners, uh, so that it, when we go on, maybe it'll be easier to recall these things that we said here. Do you have anything that you want to add to, Micah? You've been, you've been like just observing this episode. Well, you've got, uh, you've got some points that you've been brewing with, and I didn't want to interrupt you. Your excellent points that you're making. All right. Well, dear listeners, what part of this chapter stood out to you? You obviously know what stood out to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that uh, I probably uh, flogged that one. Flogged a dead horse. We can, we can get uh, more into some things that I have to discuss next time with the uh, relationship between dwarves and elves. Okay, good. Good deal. Uh, and uh, so in the meantime, you know, we want to know what you thought and uh, we will give you all the ways to contact us here in just a, just a moment. But first we have, what, what is all this? What on earth are these? Replies to the party invitations. Good gracious. Good gracious indeed. We got a good email from our friend uh, Jason Bergen. I think, I hope I'm saying that right, Jason. Is it Bergen or Bergen? I, I think it's Bergen, but I don't know. And I... There's nothing, there's very few things that I loathe more than mispronouncing somebody's name, because that's just rude. All right. He says, Secret Fire Podcast, greetings. Excellent to hear the return of the Secret Fire Podcast. I trust you had a marvelous holiday season. Uh, we lament with you the loss of uh, FCC, Finding Christ in Cinema, and Secret Fire Podcast websites and blogs. That is a grievous loss. Grievous loss, yes. Uh, and I still have not recovered from that, and nor have I actually even tried. I've really, really, really been dejected about that. <laughs> I really have. Uh, this harkens back um, uh, to episode number 39, Lothlorien Part 2. I've not fully thought this through. Maybe you can uh, entertain this idea a bit. What struck me in this chapter was the timelessness of some of the issues uh, Tolkien explores. As true today as it was then, peace and strife. Yes. Amen. That's my own interjection there. Back to the letter. When the elves of Lothlorien meet the fellowship, they have little trust for anyone entering their borders, but especially the dwarf. Most of the races or tribes of Middle-earth, from hobbits, dwarves, men, elves, to uh, pukul men, seem to have difficulty trusting outsiders. Reminds me of the uh, provincialism going on uh, in many of our countries, states, and provinces right now, indeed in the whole world over. Mistrust of others that are different somehow is rampant. Okay, stop. Let me interject. 
truer, truer words cannot be spoken. No. And and that is that's man. That is that you can lay that directly on the heart of man. You know, Jesus said it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of him because out of the out of the heart flow, you know, what uh fornications and adulteries and murder and strife and all of these things. It's the human heart. Yeah. Okay, back to the letter. In Lord of the Rings, it is manifested through race and cultures. It takes much to unite them. The races of Middle-earth must unite against a common enemy, yet each race struggles to put aside old quarrels and truly embrace each other as comrades, brothers in arms. In our world, we preach acceptance and it seems uh, we open up our arms to strangers until our comfort or way of life is threatened. Gosh, Jason, you are preaching, brother. Back to his letter. And then we throw up the wall and go hermit. We have seen through World War I and World War II that it does take a lot to unite nations. But just, uh, just a whiff of a perceived threat and we throw up our guard. I've always seen Lothlorien to represent those seasons of peace in our lives that are so refreshing to our souls. Like those great weekend afternoons where two hours spent at a sandbar on a river feels like two days. Aragorn said that the only peril was that which you brought with you. When faced with peace, we can be like Boromir and hold on to the darkness in our mind or embrace the wonder of rest like Legolas or Aragorn, who treasure it for the strength it brings them in the next trial. Maybe it is no question that Haldir and the elves guard their land jealously. They know the value it has. I shall hold the peaceful moments of life more dear to me henceforth. What are your thoughts? Keep up the fantastic work and have an eye to that dwarf. We have the honor to remain yours deeply, Jason Bergen. What are our thoughts? I think you're a genius. You blew it out of the water. Yeah, you and got to give you props for bringing up the Pukelman. Of yeah. all things. <laughs> like, what? This guy mentioned the Pukelman? Like, <laughs> no, that, I mean, you. Yeah, no, poetically put, to say the least. Yep. We, yes, we feign open arms and, 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 inclusion and help and camaraderie and fellowship and and all of these wonderful things until the really tough decisions and uh mentioning world war one and world war two was very appropriate because i i'm sure that how tolkien manages to um capture that sense of uh guarding your own so well is because he literally was his life was during world war one and world war two yes yes he was in world war one and then the letters between he and christopher during world war two oh my goodness that's where tolkien really i mean his letters to his son christopher man i mean he just bears his soul here's what i think about all of this stuff fantastic stuff and and really uh, okay jason nothing can be added i don't have any thoughts that can beat your thoughts on this that was beautifully worded and i agree with you a hundred percent and there's some hard things in there to hear we have to hear those hard things in order to get to the better things in order to get to rest so thank you so much for that that was a what a blessing that uh, that feedback was now if i can scroll down here and see what's up next. Um, no other feedback. You know, we did get a couple of... Oh, shoot, I forgot to link to... Uh, we got a, some great uh, feedback on iTunes. Uh, and we appreciate that because that helps other people uh, find the podcast. But, uh, all right, party tree time, Micah. Guess what? Hmm. Last week. Last week, last week. Yes, last week... 
our good friends over at the Lamp Post Listener. That's the Narnia podcast that I love so much, and I encourage every one of our listeners to, if you are not subscribed to the Lamp Post Listener, and it's hyphenated, Lamp hyphen Post, you must be uh, subscribed to them. Fantastic show. Daniel and Phil are just two... Well, they are they are kings of Narnia, and once a king or queen of Narnia, always a king or queen of <laughs> Narnia. And I had the pleasure last week of being on their show, uh, talking about um, uh, Prince Caspian. Uh, we went through a particular uh, chapter in Prince Caspian, and I'll just give you a little tiny taste of uh, what the show sounded like near the end. I want you to listen to the entire thing, and and you will love these guys. Uh, and this actually ties into something that we were talking about earlier on today. Uh, if I can cue up the sound, here we go. One other thing I would love to ask you, Michael. So you obviously are a huge Middle Earth fan. Um, you you have the podcast, and just and even on the podcast, it is much more. It's not just you like the Lord of the Rings. Like you have a very extensive knowledge of all of the Legendarium, and. Obviously, Middle Earth comes up a lot because of Lewis's and Tolkien's relationship. And so I had a couple questions I wanted to ask you around that, which is what what do you think? It's really just two questions. What do you think the biggest similarity is between Narnia and Middle Earth? And then what do you think is probably the biggest difference? Like what's the thing that really sets them both apart individually? Let me answer the second question first, and sure. then you're going to have to re-ask re the first question. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. The, um, the the biggest difference would be what uh, well what Tolkien's uh, problem with the N Chronicles of Narnia was and um, it, allegory. Okay, now mm -hmm. Tolkien says I, I cordially dislike allegory and all of its manifestations. Tolkien felt that allegory was uh, was the author asserting dominance over the reader and saying you're going to this is what you're going to get out of the story whether you like it or not i i disagree with uh, the professor on that that's one of the one of the two things that he and i don't see eye to eye on i love allegory uh pilgrim's progress i mean you don't get any more allegorical than yeah. pilgrim's progress and which is a fantastic book but the real definition or the 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 accepted definition of allegory being a noun right is a story poem or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning you know typically a moral or political uh, meaning well Tolkien said about his own writings he says uh, anybody I'm going to paraphrase this anybody can tell that I'm a Christian by reading my stories really so that's what I did. I talked their ear off for about an hour, and <laughs> and they were actually gracious enough to 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 still release the uh, the episode. So there you go, friends. So you can follow a uh, lamppost listener on Twitter at Narnia Podcast. But like I said, just get your podcast app open and search for them, subscribe, and tell them that uh, Secret Fire Podcast sent you. Micah, anything else? I think we're good. You you got a new car. Well, you got I yourself got a, a car. I got a car, yeah. Yes, and that was uh, that took us uh, a, a few weeks. Uh, that was a few weekends of, uh, uh, well, why we weren't here for mm. part of the time that we haven't yeah. been here in the in a while, um, and so work and school and car and all that good stuff. Okay, next week we'll pick up where we left off, and Micah says he has some thoughts that he wants to share. And so we'll be looking forward to that. But before we leave, we have party invitations to send out. The Secret Fire podcast is live in the GCT Network studio whenever we are actually live in the studio. So we'll send out notifications when we're broadcasting on our Twitch page at twitch.tv slash secretfirepodcast. And the best way to get notified when we're live in the studio is via Twitter at secretfirecast. And you can join us in the Arkenstone server in Lord of the Rings Online at lotro.com. Yes, you can send us email. All email to secretfire at gctnetwork.com. Or you can call us on the Hobbit hotline uh, at 507-407-GCTN. Uh, or our backup line over there in Crick Hollow, uh, where Fatty Bulger is standing by. 
Hi, Fatty. Just checking to make sure you're still there. It's been quite a long time. Good job, Fatty. At uh, 507-407-4286. Secret Fire Podcast is available in all of your favorite podcatchers. Just search them all for the Secret Fire Podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play or Google Podcasts or whatever that one's called now. Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio wherever wherever you subscribe to podcasts our theme song hobbits dance is from the album memories of middle earth by brob dig noggy and bards you can find out more about them and by all their music at thebards.net to find out more about the secret fire podcast as well as our other shows uh, including the theonauts visit our main website at gctnetwork.com now if you like the secret fire podcast please share it with your friends and review the show in itunes but if you love the secret fire podcast uh, uh, consider becoming a patron and sustaining member of the fellowship on our patreon page at patreon.com slash g c t n and in it until blah, 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 let me try that again okay. and until next time we regret to tell you that this is the end i'm going away i'm leaving now goodbye Goodbye. Bye. It was tied to a Balrog. I think we've done that. Yeah, one. Karen. Cameron. We probably did Karen Amroth last one. It was tied to. No, we didn't. It was tied to Karen hey, Amroth. <laughs>